I bring up geography for a reason. Uh, because as you're hearing, uh, where things are matter. And you know, it's kind of the cornerstone of geography. And it's also why I teach, I'm fortunate enough to teach a wine geography course at UBC. I also teach a course in Tuscany uh, almost every year now, an experiential field course uh, looking at rural development and the role of wine, food, and tourism in uh, how things happen there. It's funny, when I looked around the world <clears throat> and I thought about, wow, if I want to take my students to a place where wine tourism really works, um, where the gold standard of agritourism is, the first thing that comes to mind is, is Tuscany to me. That might also be because my last name is Senese, and I'm a nice Italian girl from Niagara Falls. So this is where my observations have come from, uh, both my experience in the Okanagan, my experience growing up in Niagara, Canada's other wine region, and now my experience teaching this really wonderful course in, uh, in, in Tuscany. And my observations over all this long time frame of looking at this is that um, people are attracted to this whole notion of terroir and they're attracted as tourists and more and more they are attracted as migrants, as permanent tourists, as amenity migrants, people who move for lifestyle not just for uh, uh, entertainment, but, but for that experience. So I've got two case studies here based on um, my work in the Okanagan, of course, but also based on the time I've spent in, uh, in Tuscany now um, with colleagues from the University of Firenze. Um, specifically Filippo Randelli. So I, I throw up these maps because I was sure that no one would know where the Okanagan is, but thank you Greg again because he introduced uh, Canada's desert wine region to you earlier in the week and, and Tuscany of course. Now, the course that I teach in Tuscany um, is rolled out uh, at a place called Castello Sanino in Monte Spertoli, uh, Tuscany. It's about 20, k 20 kilometers south, e east, east, west of Florence. It is a working uh, winery, uh, olive orchard, farm. It's also a historical site. Um, we have formed out of a relationship of putting these courses on over the years uh, uh, something that we're calling a working group with Filippo, several other Italian colleagues, some German colleagues and my North American colleagues because we all found this real interest in you know what is it that terroir does for um, the education of students, for rolling out rural development, and um, how can we improve upon it around the world? So, this paper in particular is three members of uh, uh, is coming from three members of our working group, and I'm really pleased to be working uh, with them. So, I'm going to start with my definition of terroir because I've heard a whole bunch of them, and I was so happy to hear Scott talk about the fact that humans are actually involved in terroir uh, because I'm a human geographer and I well along with thinking uh, that place matters I also know that people matter in the idea of terroir so I've borrowed here from Tim Unwin's use of the term in the geography of wine textbook from a few years ago uh, based on a UN kind of working definition of terroir that was created in order to get a really multidisciplinary group of researchers together and agree on what at least a few key elements of terroir are. Now explain this because it's going to be important in terms of what I tell you about uh, shortly. And the first thing that everyone degree, uh, agrees on is that, uh, here's the geography again, it is delimited geographic space a key element here and that space is both living and innovative. Second, there are both environmental natural factors and there are also human factors. And I think we agree on that uh, in this room as well. And thirdly, especially this is especially important for the tourism product, typicality, authenticity is based on that geographical delimitation. 
The quality of the product, the uniqueness of it, is based on that delimitation. So anything originating in that geographic space, the authenticity and the quality of it is based on the geographical delimitation. So drawing borders around things becomes really, really important. Okay, so remember that in a few minutes. So how do we get from terroir, in the vinicultural sense of the word, to terroir tourism? Well, my good friend and colleague now, Filippo Randelli at, uh, at Firenze, is an economic geographer who explained this idea of evolutionary economic geography to me, EEG. He says, you know, there's an evolution and a narrative that we can talk about in time and in space that's brought us in Tuscany from this notion of a terroir in a vinicultural sense to the notion of tourism in an economic sense. And the more I listen to him talk about Tuscany, the more I realize, holy smokes, the same thing is going on in the Okanagan, where I am. Maybe not in the same order, and maybe not for the same key reasons, but there are some real parallels going on. And that's how we got to, the, to this paper. So we're talking about the process of going from the idea of terroir to terroir tourism, and now I also think migration, permanent tourism. Okay, so we have these two case studies in Tuscany and the Okanagan Valley, and the key drivers of the evolution that we're talking about are, or happen at three different scales, the micro, the meso, and the macro scale. The micro scale, local, usually pioneers of the industry, the meso scale in a, a regional scale and then a macro scale at, a, at a, a, a wide kind of market change in what's going on. And the drivers of this change are number one, identification of terroir has to happen first. And that identification is both in a physical sense of landscape and also in a cultural sense in terms of how things are done and how people produce that landscape. Number two, crisis drives this kind of process. Um, in, our, in our sense, we're talking about a crisis of rural reconfiguration, usually in land holdings in rural space. Uh, three, windows of opportunity that are built out of crisis. Pioneers that take advantage of the windows of opportunity then legislation that usually happens at a regional scale that lends itself to multifunctionality of the industry and finally a huge paradigm shift that we've seen happen in the tourism industry and in lifestyle in particular. Okay, so these are the drivers we're going to go through in both Tuscany and the Okanagan and try and figure this out. The mezzadria, I know there are Italians in the room and I'm not pronouncing it as well as I should. Is it mezzadria or mezzadria? Mezzadria. Hmm? Sharecropping. Been around, was around in Italy from about the 15th century to the 20th century. The whole idea of sharecropping is really quite simple. You have a wealthy landowner who lives in the city. This may sound familiar. You have a wealthy landowner who lives in the city, who derives money out of the product. You hire a whole bunch of farmers to farm the land on small parcels of land, and in return, the small farmers get a home, the Casa Colonica, and they get food and they have an income based on those small, small parcels of land. Oh, that didn't come out well at all. Now this, the castle that we actually stay at for our course, is one of those estates from, uh, from the sharecropping system. You, as you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the estate, the Castello Sanino building estate. All of the lands that surround it are here, about 140 hectares. Um, mixed cropping, small parcels of land. We've got uh, woodlots, olive, uh, and grapes and also some wheat up here and some gardening going on, market kind of gardening. At the estate, you have the castle, towers, the home, the residence of the wealthy, um, the wealthy landowner, and then here, the fattoria, where the wine is made, the olives uh, are 
are uh, processed, and the farmers who lived in the small places out here. Right? Okay. So the, uh, the sharecropping system ended in the post-World War II era. Now the important thing about this was the crisis that it created as the farmers left the land and deserted thousands, literally thousands, of these houses. They left the land in order to go to the cities and make more money, of course, and this made some sense. Okay, after the crisis came windows of opportunity, and this is where the amenity migrants come from. The windows of opportunity opened as wealthy, largely retired business people from Britain, later Holland and Germany bought up these abandoned houses because they were in love with the lifestyle of the Italian rural countryside. Because they were in love with that lifestyle, they also um, uh, fixed up these houses uh, with real um, attention to the detail of the era in which they were built. Now those houses became the agritourism that we see today, based on this window of opportunity. On top of that window of opportunity and the pioneers that built up the industry, uh, Tuscan legislation at the mesoscale um, put money into young farmers who then came from the city to farm the land and were able to uh, rebuild some of the wine and olive or orchard industry. They also created the first legislation that created the agriturismo. And then EU legislation at a larger scale came in and actually protected the landscape in a couple of different ways. Okay. Sorry, wrong button. Now, on top of this came the sea change of a paradigm shift in tourism. Our hosts at Castello Sanino, in fact, were young uh, urban people who came back to this abandoned house and fixed it up. But they also witnessed the sea change in tourism and lifestyle and have kept their home now as an educational institute to transfer the traditional qualities of, um, of terroir of the region. They've also become part of the super Tuscan crowd, uh, making really good wine and, uh, and doing quite well of it. This is actually a group of, oops, shoot, a group of students who were able to take part in drying of the Vinsanto grapes uh, last year, which is pretty darn cool. But their idea is also, along with the sea change, that this, uh, all of this needs to come from a sustainable environment. Okay, so that's Tuscany, and I only have two minutes now to talk about the Okanagan. But this is where I come from. Same drivers of change, not quite in the same order. The Okanagan, oh, that's the wrong one, has always been a tourism spot based on natural resources. Agritourism in orcharding, ski tourism in the winter, and beach tourism in the summer. We call it beaches, peaches, and uh, golf nowadays. Um, what happened next was a crisis in rural reconfiguration. In the 70s, the government figured out that we were running out of farmland. Um, so they built something called the ALR, the Agricultural Land Reserve, that did two things, valorize farmland and also politicize farmland, so that farmers were unable to sell their land out of farming. Um, after, from this as well, there was a, 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 a <laughs> now I'm trying to go too fast. The NAFTA, NAFTA agreement came in, um, Vineyardists were asked to pull up the vines in 1989, were paid $8,000 per acre to pull up vines, and the vineyard um, actually went down tremendously. You can't see this. In 1990, there were only 1,000, 1,500 acres of grapes. We are now up over 10,000. So out of this crisis came the resurgence, as you can see, of the wine industry. Today, the wine tourism industry leads, I'll go to the next slide, leads in terms of economic performance, and Andy Buenge has told us, in fact, that there's over-reliance on tourism here. 
Uh, this lifestyle brand has also resulted in a whole bunch of amenity migration, and I have to stop talking now. But we now know that uh, more than 70% of our wineries are owned by migrants to the valley for a lifestyle change. And if you want to ask me about that later, I'll, I'll tell you. But Byron's pulling me off the stage. Thank you very much.